see if I have something like that somewhere. I've never been able to find it. You can also just take your laptop to the shitter with you if you need to. Yeah, just just don't just don't you know do whatever uh, when you're on a conference call like uh, what's his bucket from CNN? That's Jeffrey CNN. Tubin. Do, do, that the Tubin. do the Tubin. Do the Tubin. Yeah, that's the funniest thing. That's like one of the memes that have been around, like with uh, the whole Rittenhouse trial thing. Like Jeffrey Tubin calls Kyle Rittenhouse an idiot, the same guy who masturbated on live TV. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on a conference a, call. On a work a, call. On a work conference call for <laughs> what was it? The, oh, the gosh, newspaper so he worked funny. for. Yeah, that's that's. Oh, I. I and then the funny thing is, he got like six months away from CNN. They're like, well, he didn't do it on our on our conference call, so. Anyway, welcome to the Paracast. I'm your host, Tomas the Boss Fernandez. Uh, joining me tonight, uh, he once did a nickel in prison for tickling the fancy. It's Steve Kosky. Uh, tickling a fancy is perfectly legal in the lower 48 states. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, what, what is it? Oh, yeah. Uh, he wore women's clothing because he found out he was going to be cross examined. It's Robert Wyatt. I thought it would get me some like help from the jury. So why were you running? Because I was going to put out a fire. And I was like, where were you? Going? I was going to go put out a fire. So why were you running? It's a fire. <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Okay. This is. Did you know? Did you know the the, the binger is now an official word in the Urban Dictionary? Oh, is it? The definition is like you know, if you f up so badly that you end up helping the other side. Well, I it would be you know just for his own. Um, his own, I guess, mental sanity. It'd be nice if one of his witnesses didn't turn into one of the prosecution's witnesses. And like, <laughs> if he didn't get owned by a seventy-year witness, is like, did you go over to your friend's house and play a game which involves you two with AR-15s killing other people? Do you did you play Call of Duty? He goes, <laughs> yeah, it's a video game. And then everyone else is like, the problem is now there's a lot of like 40 year old jurors who are like, yeah, I, I played it too. <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's, it's going like, downhill pretty the quick. The funny bit was when he was, it, uh, you know what? I am the worst. I am the single worst person at predicting any outcome of anything. I will freely admit that, but it doesn't look good. And you sit there and it's like, uh -huh. The prosecution can't really get him on facts, and so they're really trying to push the emotional narrative well, of it. But the funny bit that I thought that just killed me was he's sitting there, and he's like, you went to the store to buy an AR-15. And he and he's like, well, why didn't you buy a pistol? He's like, well, because I can't legally buy a pistol. And he's like, well, you could have got a shotgun. Well, actually, I wanted a shotgun, but they weren't in stock. And it's just, I mean, why they were they just in trying stock? so hard. The rioting. They weren't in stock in Kenosha because of the rioting. That's why everyone... Well, the, the, my favorite thing, too, is, like, basically getting up and start questioning him about his silence. And then the judge is like, All right, jury. Why don't you, you need go, to go in the other room. You need to go in the other room real quick. And it's just like, you know, you don't get to comment on someone being silent as a, as a mark of their guilt. <laughs> so it's just... The, it's, the thing is, when the judge did that, it was like back in the old days when you're... When, you said something to your mom and you look out of the corner of your eye and you see your yeah. dad there and you can see his eyes like go wide. Yeah. And then the belt comes whipping off. <laughs> and at that point you're like, Oh crap. <laughs> oh no. Was messed up. He just said, get a switch. The, the funny thing is too, is like I listened to Mark Garagos. Uh, he does a podcast with Adam Carolla called uh, reasonable doubt. Mark Garagos, the famous defense attorney. And then of course you listen to, um, um, Alan Dershowitz and they're both going like, uh, Oh, yeah, we've seen this a million times. What is he trying to do? Oh, he's trying to get a mistrial. Like, you start, it's like, you don't want to play the game anymore, so you just start shoving people. You just start producing as many technical fouls as you can. And then... Trying to back into the RO. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like, doing this, backing up, just throwing his elbows, throwing his magazines everywhere, trying to tackle somebody just to, I, I, I need to get this dismissed. But, yeah. Okay. The thing that was interesting was the defense got that photographer guy up there, and they they start talking to him, and they're like, "And you met with the prosecution, yeah?" And the pro and so so what happened? He's like, "Well, the prosecution showed me this picture. Says, do you know who this is?" And he puts it down. He picks up the yeah. phone. Says, "Do you know who this is? This is uh, Zeminski." And then he puts the phone down. He picks up the picture. Says, "Would you like to change your statement?" And the guy's like, uh, "I want a lawyer." 
And then, well, and then defense gets up there and they try and like talk him out of it. And he just like, he kind of just beat the defense uh, or the prosecution. The prosecution, up over yeah. It. Well, the prosecution oh, was, was so like, bad. the prosecution brought him into the office to cha- have him change his statements. And this is like, you can kind of see it. Like, dealing with autistic people is like, it's not try. It's not good to try to like autistic people don't pick up on like it's kind of like a lie, like to go along with the lie. And mm-hmm. so they were like asking him is like um, he was telling him, and then uh, the defense attorneys, uh, the prosecution attorneys, tried to have me change my uh, my statement. And he goes, "We didn't try to have you st- change your statement." He goes, "No, you did. You tried to have me change my statement, yeah. right?" <laughs> And they're just like, there's so many times where, what is it? What's the uh, what's the prosecutor's name again? Oh, there's Binger, and then there's Big Boy. I don't know. They just call they call him Big Boy. Yeah, the Big Boy guy in the back. Every day you see him do one of these at the desk. So Binger's doing all the cross examining. You just see him do this, just palm on yeah. the face, looking down. So are you saying that Mr. Rittenhouse didn't shoot you until so when you your hands were up? Pointed the gun at him. And then when you pointed the gun at his head. That's when he shot you. Yes, That's I would correct. agree. I would agree with that. And then you just see the guy. And you see Big Boy. He's like, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> You're just like, like this isn't going well. And then I mean, like when the judge went and yelled at the prosecution for ten minutes solid. Yeah. And then they go they go to lunch or whatever. Come back and defense is like, uh, Your Honor, I want there's there needs to be a mistrial with prejudice yeah. because of all this. And he, they actually said. He said, I mean, like, defense is like, we're not going to say that we're winning this, but it sure seems like the prosecution wants a mistrial because they've done so badly that they want another uh, shot at bite at the apple. Yeah. Well, if they if they get the the, the judge doesn't want to have it not go to the jury. And but it depends on what their closing arguments are. I can see if the if uh, the prosecution uh, tries to say something so inflammatory in front of the jury, like one more last time, that if it never even goes to the jury and they just dismiss well, he, it right off. He wanted two and a half. Was it two and a half hours, uh, just for his close, the prosecution, and the and everybody's like, what? Yeah. And, and eventually, the, eventually the judge is like, okay, you guys get two and a half hours total. Yeah. Because he wanted like two hours for the, uh, uh, two hours for the close, and then thirty minutes for the rebuttal. Yeah, it was uh, it, it's been it's really interesting to me because I like to watch I like to watch court TV. I don't know why I just do for some reason. And I've seen judges that are good, judges that are bad and judges that most judges are just they're just right there. This one, he seems to be a pretty good judge. And I don't know if it's because I'm kind of on team Rittenhouse, but it seems like he, he kind of is a pretty good well, judge and knows what he's talking about. He's He's very much pulled the book out, read you the law. So what I heard from a lot of people who were talking about it and the lawyers is that his reputation was very pull, pull the book out, read the law to you. He's been practicing law for like 50 years and he's very pro defendant, regardless of who the defendant is. Like he's very much by the book, not to have his, his oh, the, rulings the straight thrown up out. innocence till proven guilty kind of guy. Well, yeah, he's, gotcha. he's a very much civil rights kind of guy for the people. So it's, it'll be interesting. We'll find out Monday. But anyway, what we did on Saturday was a boatload of giggles and fun, except for Robert wasn't there. If Robert and Kenny were there, it would have been one of the best days of shooting we could have had. But it was absolutely... I was, I was helping around the house. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was so fun. So it's like I signed up late Thursday because I just decided I was going to go do it. And then I saw Steve show up in the middle of the morning. So I was like, oh, great, now Steve's here. And then Jared Stepp found his way onto our squad and Brett Thomas found his way onto our squad. And we all got together. And, of course, after we make the decision for all of us to shoot carry optics, Steve Kosky shows up to do production. production. <laughs> That's what we call a hider. <laughs> so he hider went production in, in production. It's well, to become a hider. Division. Well, there was one other guy. I think it was his first match that was in production. Steve only beat him by like 62%. Oh, jeez. But... <laughs> Well, the funny thing was... Steve is routinely shows up at the kindergarten The funny thing was, was I was only about a percent lunch. behind Tom. Yeah, Steve had one of these matches... Percent and a half, maybe. ...where Steve just didn't miss a shot and shot super well all day. So if I was shooting production, I probably wouldn't have beat him. Well, but to since... be fair, Tom, I mean, I watched I mean, watched a couple of videos, and you, and you shot you shot it like you would shoot production. I shot... I, I would and we, say... we, did, we talked about that a little bit, which is fine. I, That's what yeah. everybody does. I shot a little faster than I shot production, but I found the first stage, and I shot the first stage, and I had a malfunction, but I shot in, like, 24 seconds, and then, like, Jared Stepp shot it in 17, and Tyrell shot it in 
uh, like 21. And so after that, I started to actually pull the trigger a little faster and become a little bit more competitive at it. But it's it's my first USPSA match in CO, and it was um, it was a lot of fun, but it, it was a big grind, a big push to, to get myself to go out there and shoot faster. But, man, I... I had a I had a hell of a time. It was a lot of fun. And I had and a it, hell of a time shooting iron sights. It was just like coming home. It was like <laughs> mashed potatoes and gravy. It was just wonderful. It's like, oh yeah, I know how this works. <laughs> so it was it was it was a they had I don't all the stages were really good. There I don't think there was a bad stage the whole time. We had this one standard stage that was draw you had like eight targets and it was draw shoot one freestyle to each target, reload, shoot strong hand, one to each target. And it was like tux, uh, like four tuxes and two uh, no shoots on it. And like, what, like one open or something like that target on the whole thing. It was your thing. typical array. No shoots, slant left, slant, slant right, tux. Yeah. Tuxedo, open. And so it was the screen. And then the second string is weak hand. And I just, re I just, my left hand shakes just kind of naturally, just kind of. It just kind of like shakes a little bit. It's got a, like a little jitter to it. And then I grab and I pull up the the RMR and I start gripping it. And that gun, is, that dot's just doing this. <laughs> like it literally, it's going from I'm sitting there trying to shoot um, the tuxedo, a tuxedo, and it's going, from shoulder, and it's going shoulder. from shoulder to shoulder in there. And it's a Virginia cow. And I'm like, now, now, now. And it, it ended up being all right, but it was um. Was it you that walked up to me and says, why does it look like Star Wars out there? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did that. Somebody's like, it looks like Star, Star Wars. Wars. Laser beams well, jumping all over the place. Well, what How many is... people were shooting carry optics at that Everybody. Match? 30, Everybody yeah. in the match. 30. I heard there was a lot. Yeah, it was probably 30 like people. 50 out of 65 people at the match were probably shooting. No, how many was it, Tom? 30. 30? There was three people wow. shooting carry optics. I mean, production. You were two of them because one of them was your reshoot on the classifier. Oh, yeah. So yeah, it was it was pretty heavy for thirty. I came in I came in eighth. I came in I think seventy eight percent of Stefan who who shot it. GM and the one guy I was really trying to stay within. I was trying to stay within like fifteen percent of like Brett Thomas, which God, I, did. I love watching Brett shoot. He is so fast and smooth. I he just. He's a pleasure to watch shoot. Yeah, and it makes so, it even better since he like shoots like once. Well, this twice is the first time he shot in like a month, in yeah, six months he, or something. Yeah, he but he's still, he's so I busy. don't know, he's still got it. He's still fun to watch. Yeah, it, he was he was fun to watch. So it was uh, it was trying to I was like eight percent behind step shoot carry optics. So I, I I thought like okay, it's like this is your first match. You got to get kind of used to the pace. But I was about eight percent behind step, and. Step is just pure get a get a get a get a get a get a getcha. You know, he's just like charge and split and charge and split. And, and Brett Thomas is just like Muhammad Ali. He just step, bing, 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 step, bing, bing. And he just, it, it was just absolutely a fun time to watch. But it was a good, it was a good first match for carry optics. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was That's awesome. a ton of fun. I, I, it was fun. I've never been so happy about coming in eighth place at a local match uh, in my life. It was just... Me too. I was like, 17th! <laughs> Hell yeah! 17th! It was Take just... that, suckers. Iron sights and 10-round mags. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you guys actually shot a USPSA match? Oh, you shoot, you shoot LTD, so I, I guess that... I mean, that's kind of a, that's kind of USPSA. It's kind of. I guess that counts. Uh... This was my first USPSA club match of the year. No kidding. Yep. What? Yep. I, I mean, I shoot them every month, pretty it, much. This was my, I think, sixth match. So I shot two IDPA matches this year. I shot the Super Shoot. I shot Utah State. I shot another. I shot a another IDPA match in Carry Optics, and then shot this match, and that was my first club match of the year for USPSA. Wow. So. I mean, I, I mean, I'm I, at this point. I'm kind of like well into the off season. Although I gotta set up, I gotta set up one of those indoor matches. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, I mean, literally, it was one of the things of looking at it and now seeing that like I, I had pretty good points. I only had one mic for the day, no deltas, you know, a handful of Charlies or whatever. But I was just sitting there. It's like okay, I could probably pursue shooting IDPA carry optics at this pace. But I am totally rejuvenated in 
in USPSA. Like, I feel like getting up and dry firing. I feel like doing stuff. I just, it was, it was a blast. It was an absolute blast. No well, deltas, yeah. no mics. Did Jared and I both, both Steph and I both shot that standards pace, uh, no deltas, no mics, right? Yeah, yeah. He he crushed. I mean, he he shot it like four seconds faster than me, but. And Steve Steve started pulling out the uh, when he was shooting weak hand, his the position of his strong hand was like up like this, while he was like bam, 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 and so he was giving the, the literal Han Solo. Steve Steve probably <laughs> shot more shots oh. weak handed. Yeah, really. Yeah, you, you, you have your hand up there. You got to get your match video. But you had your hand up there like, wah, 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 like a classic Han Solo oh, pose. And then once, okay. and the last stage we did, there was such an awkward position when you had to shoot some, like, poppers. And two of the poppers were available at, what, 35 yards or something like that. Yeah. And then you had to go into a very, very tight position and she targets to your right. And Steve got in there and he was like really tight. So we just stuck the gun out strong hand and went bam, 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 bam. Steve was Steve was having an IDPA field USPSA match. I didn't even think about shooting those strong hand, but once I got up there, I was like, it's gonna take me longer to get to reestablish a grip on this gun, and they're only at like seven, eight yards. I'm like, I'm just gonna shoot. <laughs> <laughs> So he just sat there and he sent him out. But man, it was, I had such a fun time. The one thing, there's a couple things that, you know, shooting CEO was, is um, the stage planning is much easier. The execution of that stage plan, for me, is a little harder right now because it's a little harder to sit there and find the uh, the uh, dot in some situations because I'm just, I'm just not used to it. So the stage well, plan is easier. Got, I mean, objectively, Tom, I mean, not bagging at all. If you got a better dot, it would um, it would help you a ton. The Listen. RMR is great, but you've already I mean look at that you've got those backup iron sights on that thing already. You can't so you've already like off. you've already cut out you've already cut out a huge chunk of your window. You have a tiny like tombstone for a window. I'm not saying it does work. Okay, I've got them on one of my guns. I've got that same setup on one of my guns, and it does work. Mm -hmm. But I got my I got the I worst flashlight noticed. for weight too. I got the worst yeah. flashlight for weight. But I've I've just noticed that like different optics present um, better and allow you to track the dot yeah. a little easier. That's not to say one is better or the worse. It's just things that I have observed, which no, is that probably does mean better and worse. Yeah, I'm trying a to be. I'm trying to dot. be kind of generous, you know. I you just guys, buy an SRO. You know, it's literally. I mean, literally, let's like, it's the buy once, cry if you, once. If you, you, if you, can, you buy three if you can find an SRO in the MOA you that you want. Them, yeah. <laughs> you got Robert's him. offering one for sale officially. Right, it's two ninety nine. He's giving he's giving it away at Hollow Sun prices. Uh, I, I I would not mind I would not mind having a a competition style optic on. The uh, look at the Delta Point, Steve. You've got that. I've got one of those. They're they're fantastic optics. They work exceptionally well. I'll let mine go for bottom dollar. Five hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> now that I'm shooting iron sights again. No, you're not. I went there, I did that. I'm done with CO. Oh, give me, I'm give me your when, 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 he, when he show when he shows up at the match and he's got he's got his like five focals on. He's like, hey, yeah, there, there they are, there they are. He's yeah. got the super tall front sight. I mean, that that could become an issue. <clears throat> but no, I, I don't mind having that. I just, you know, this is the gun I, this is the carry optics gun I have. Uh, so this is the carry optics gun I'm going to shoot until something else. And if I do find an SRO or something like this, I'll pull this RMR off this and maybe shoot it on this or get another um, red dot ready gun and then put a bigger optic on that. But it is it is fun. The dot doesn't move too much in the uh, Glock window. The one thing I noticed that's super easy is plate racks and distant targets. It is so ridiculously easy to sit there and do that stuff. Like, you clean a plate rack with irons, you're like, yeah, I feel good about myself. I did that. And then you just sit there, and you're just watching the dot in the carry optics, and you're just like, yeah, this, yeah, is, the way, this is the way it should go. But even go. then, even then you still miss. Yeah, I mean, it, and because, that's... I mean, because you see the dot there, and you're like, pull the trigger, and you're already looking at the next one. So it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. it, does allow you, it does allow you to go faster, but it allows you to fail faster, too. Yeah. Well, we had this mini popper that was slanted because it was meant to be shot out of another position presented to us at oh, 35 oh, slant, yards. Oh, slant to the range. Yeah, so it's it's like slanted to the range. So it's like a, you have a 45-degree presentation to this, the face of the 
of the popper. And I just, that was the one I was going to draw to. So I just bring up the, the old carry optics dot. Bing. Down she goes. Yes. <laughs> First shot. Start riding. Yeah. And it was just like, oh, it's, it, it, it's. I mean, that, it, that was one of the hardest shots we have had in a match in a long, long time. Mini popper, 35 yards, turned 45 degrees. So it's quite narrow. And I can't believe how well we shot it. Like, you ripped it first shot. I hit it first shot. Step goes, I mean, he Seven went one, two, three, four. four. <laughs> he went one, two, three, four on all, all the steel from that first posi that position. I mean, everyone, Brett, Brett just crushed it. Like, how is nobody missing this? This is a hard shot. This you thing is thank, three inches. It's effectively three inches wide. It is at 35 yards. You can thank Dirk for that because he's the one who's come up with all these crazy stages that have actually like caused people to increase their skill level to try and shoot some of this stuff. And so, I mean, I mean, credit where it's due. Yep. He's put out, he's, he's built stages that have really caused people to actually like up their technical abilities. Oh, and Tyrell, he, Tyrell would have hit it, but he just, he decided to shoot a different stage plan. He ran to the last box, right? Yeah, he ran to the last last box and yeah. shot it where you're where you're quote supposed to shoot it. And yeah, he did it. And Tyrell got screwed over himself because he made a memory stage, and then was the first one on the memory stage. And oh. then everyone was walking the memory stage, and he couldn't get a good walk through on that memory stage. And so he ran into a little trouble, walked past a target that he was supposed to shoot, finished it, and then. Let's we just... all we all looked back and it was just like, you know, okay. I think, I think between, he had a foot fault on that one too. It was just it was just. Yo, a... he did have a foot fault. That's right, because <laughs> so I was rough. holding the timer. He planted his foot six inches out of bounds. Oh, geez. fired his last two shots. All right, like, let's, just, let's, it, just, let's just let's just let's just make an agreement between the three of us. From now on, if we ever show up to a memory stage, one that's like legitimately a memory stage, let's just let's just agree that like the three of us are going to let whoever is the first person shooting. We're just going to stand back and let them have the stage. I mean, give them that five minutes to look through yeah. it. Because then we can all watch how they screw it up and then make make adjustments on the fly. Yeah, that but sucks. Give, Tyrell give, would have probably give them like all the benefits of that memory stage. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, it was, I, I, it was, it was a, it was a boat load of noodles of fun. Yeah, it, I heard, it, and the weather was nice yesterday. It I mean, great. it was really nice for November. It was fantastic. So now, actually, speaking of November, aren't you guys? Doesn't um, I forgot the name of the club? Uh, the farm, the the uh, UDPL. UDPL. Uh, don't they do the? Aren't they doing their big steel match, steel challenge match thing right right after Thanksgiving? Well, they have a match uh, Saturday after Thanksgiving. I don't know if it's a steel. It's a all steel match. Oh, that that must be what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it's not the that, super shoot. Yeah, that's in and August. It's not or steel something. challenge. It'll just be a steel match. Yeah, that sounds like fun. But my daughter's I have a, twenty. I have a commitment from my wife to shoot steel challenge. We're gonna go shoot steel challenge at Slipsa on the 29th. She, she I sh keep showing her match videos. She's like, I think I want to try it. I'm like, let's start with steel challenge. <laughs> it's, she gonna shoot it her is, 22? That is the that is the most beginner friendly way to start. There's yep. no draw from the holster. It's it's a fantastic. That's what we thing. need. We need. Are you going to do a uh, twenty-two like little twenty-two long rifle? Uh, you know it. Right on. It's iron sights and twenty-two and no reloading and. Put put an optic on it. Make it fun. <laughs> I got I got the twenty-two forty-five. I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not, wrong. I'm not wrong. I mean, no, a that's and true. An optic is pretty is pretty darn enjoyable. Except I have for a dot. Except for except for finding the optic for your first time. As a newer shooter, that's going to be probably pretty hard. I'd probably just leave with the irons. That would be fun. Uh, no, it's it's not that bad. Once you find once you find it, the gun doesn't re the gun doesn't recoil. It's a big window. We're not using like the RMR windows. It um, leave my RMR window alone. All right, he doesn't. He's got his alliers. He's doing bad. He's doing fine. It's mm. it's like it's like it's like that guy on Seinfeld. You know, he he became Jewish just so he could make Jewish jokes. I have an RMR, <laughs> so I can make fun of them. No, but it's. I mean, I have an RMR on my, uh, what is it, my Mark IV, and it's it's like cheating, but it's just, it's fun. It makes it easy to, to go out and have a great time um, shooting low recoil uh, 22s. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, that's a good that's a good thought. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Robert, did you do anything? 
No, not really. I it's kind of a slow week. My my boss's uh my boss's brother died, and so I actually ended up spending pretty much my entire week just trying to do all of all of his work and kind of keep the plant running. And that sort of sucked, but by the time Friday rolled around, I'm like, I'm done. And he's like, yeah, we need to go and help out. I'm like, ugh, fine. I'll go be a decent person. Steve, yeah, did you... Yeah, I, I have to do that, like, once a year. Is that a I also got three? to shoot my my brother's my brother's Glock 17. I shot that today in the middle of a mountain bike ride. It was wonderful. Did you stop he's got, first? I don't know what kind of a trigger he's got in here, but it is wonderful. It works... It just... Do you think, do you There's think no big a... wall. It just slides up and... you. you it just kind of oh. slides up and the trigger drops. God, I wonder if it's one of those ghost, what is it, the ghost rocket triggers that basically you just roll through the whole thing. The rocket yeah, connectors, that's what it yeah. it feels like. Yeah, those, those are pretty nice. You it's about your... a... Go ahead. Oh, no, I shot a, my fifth gen Glock 17 in production yesterday. And, and shot it well. Did you shoot your 509 yet? Yes. I Yes, that has a... It's, it feels very Glock-like, except the trigger goes up but then there's quite a wall at the end and i was shooting some groups and i noticed like my first few shots were low and left and then i'm like okay it's this wall at the end that's bigger than a glock wall yeah. and when i actually would get a good break you know exactly point of aim bullets were going right where i was pointed yep yeah so it shoots quite well awesome awesome, awesome. well if this becomes a short show that's fine because i'm on muscle relaxants and i'm pretty Ooh. tired yeah, it's it's just a great day. Donny says I do I do drugs too. <laughs> Donny says give me a hug and my I have this spastic neck bit every once in a while and she like put her teeth on my collarbone and I kind of went like like this <laughs> and it just fired that up. So now she's now she's apologetic. She didn't mean to give me a freaking <laughs> neck spasm. But uh, if you have a neck spasm, it doesn't hurt to have a good looking belt. So head on over to dominatedefense.com and get yourself one of the uh, get it get a concealed carry belt. You can get one of the competition belts. Any belt that you get there is absolutely fantastic. Wore mine yesterday. And then wore a different one on the way out when we went shopping and I went looking at guns. So head on over to DominateDefense.com. Use promo code PARA10 and save 10% off your order. Also head on over to Gallon Bullets. Use promo code PUPRO10 and save 10% off your first order. And check out Precision Holsters, Fast Holster, their competition holster, and use promo code PARA10 and save 10% off. So... Oh, and then uh, before you got, yeah, go to Telegram. You can get Telegram on your computer now. You can, now it's turned into ask questions and a chat. So now we have to sort through your guys' <laughs> banter to one another to find the questions. So, Robert, hit it. From Sebastian Munoz, what sport are you guys shooting next after the fall of USPSA? A house divided against itself the cannot show. stand. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah, gotta... I listened to that Steger, his little five-minute podcast, and I'm I'm like, what the hell is this all about? And anyway, yeah, I'm that's... out of the loop. Yeah, I, I, we probably don't want to get into it here, but no, I like getting into it. Uh, fill all me in. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear the five-minute podcast. What was his deal? I I barely understand it. He had some five-minute rant, basically saying that they're the board of direct. Well, let me see. The board of directors is trying to change the bylaws so that the board of directors can elect the president of USPSA and not the members. And then he had some, some rant let, like uh, the board of directors is out to screw Matt Hopkins or something. I'd, beyond that, I didn't really take home any big messages. So the board of directors is, is out, is looking at setting up, uh, at being, uh, the board of directors is looking to hire a CEO, the president would still be elected by the membership at membership generally. Um, and the idea that the board is out to screw Matt Hopkins is an interesting one if it wasn't for the fact that the board all agreed to let Matt Hopkins serve as Area 3 director before his term even began. And so it seems to me, and I could be wrong because I'm wrong on a lot of things, as evidenced by this entire year, that Steger has a vested interest in pushing somebody into the position that would do what he wants them to do. And I'm not saying that's what he's doing, but it sure seems like it because he sure as heck doesn't. He's not really involved in USPSA anymore. I mean, he ran a section, he ran a sectional match, which is fine, but he doesn't compete at a national level. 
um, at least not here. And so it sort of, to me, begs the question why he would be pursuing this so hard unless it's just Steger trying to be Steger, where he goes and he throws bombs and he just likes to start, likes to watch the world burn. And that's fine. I, mean, I have no issues with that. But when you, Steger says something and then you hear the whole story and you're like, okay, Steger kind of sounds like a douche, but that's Steger. And so we've expected for him. I'm sure, I mean, he's, he's a great shooter. He really is. But I think sometimes it seems to me that he just wants to create more havoc than um, yeah. actually do anything useful for the organization. So Cause he certainly there, doesn't provide any value to you. Is there a good reason to split up the CEO and the president responsibilities? And what, um, are, what is the, what is the division of those responsibilities? Is the, uh, Bruce, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is the CEO going to be basically just handling the financial matters and the business side of USPSA and the president's basically going to handle the game side of USPSA? All the matches. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's that, like it's like that, a match director pretty... and a range and the uh, the, the uh, chief, yeah chief range the range master. Sorry. Yeah, you're yeah you're pretty close to that. Uh, Bruce Wells, Area Six, Bruce. Uh, he was on. He was doing the Go Fast, Don't Suck. Uh, the who the F are you? Uh, thing that uh, they've been that Bill Duda's been doing this week. And he said the concern is giving too much power to one person. And where in the previous the previous administration with Foley, he had all that power. I mean, because he could he basically he basically ran shop. And so the concern is that there's a couple there's a couple things to consider. Um, if you give somebody too much power, then obviously they're going to use that power because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But fundamentally, you want to have somebody in – we are giving power to a person um, who is elected by the general membership whose qualifications to run a large organization or a collaborative organization is what? They work at the shipping department for CZ or they don't have a job or they're retired from their – brick lane business yeah. how does that make them how does that give them um the know-how to run a million a multi-million dollar i don't know if it's multi-million but a million dollar organization it probably doesn't so it may it sort of so the question is well why don't we actually hire somebody who actually knows what they're doing to handle all of that element and, and that can be fired them, and can be fired it does make it easier to fire them but then have the president run the stuff that USPSA members visibly um, see, like the nationals and matches like that. And I got to be honest with you, it's kind of a valid point. Why would you want to hire somebody who has no experience running a major organization? I mean, well, especially it's kind of like electing only... someone who's never served in government before. Well, it can go the one and you, thing, and you and you and you, Steve, you saw how the, well that went to your, to that went. I mean, there's problems that that come from that, right? Yeah, it's a two-edged sword, and I'm not. I'm not saying I know the answer. I'm just saying, for if I would be a little upset if the board switches this around without getting member input and does something rash like that doesn't seem cool to me. Like all the other bylaw changes that have been made, like we can make rule changes now and they're instantaneous. Yeah, yeah. Like that's a bunch of crap. Well, you got to get member input. We have a to lot debate of that. this stuff. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I totally agree. I you're. I don't, you're not saying anything that's, that's out of line. It's perfectly fair. It's hard because it seems to me, and I, like I said, I could be wrong on all this, but it seems to me that Steger likes to find something that conforms yeah. to his personal narrative, so, and he just pushes that. So let's quit that. talking about Steger's position. Let's just talk about what would be best for USPSA. I'm not sure that the member that the CEO-president split is a good idea. I'd like to see people discuss it at, yeah. at some length before we jump wholeheartedly into that. Yeah. What's well, your, um, just curious, I mean, what's, why do you think that it's better to have the the president and CEO be the same thing? Well, that basically Foley's position. Be yeah, like I don't know. I, don't, I would just like to hear some reasoned arguments from, from both sides. That's fair. No, I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. Well, you, and and you, I think if you, if you ask any of the board members, um, I know, I know in my personal experience, every time I've ever talked to, emailed or talked to um, Area One Bruce Gary, um, he's been 
he's actually been really kind of upfront and he just tells me everything that he can. I mean, there's obviously stuff that goes into executive session that has to be an executive session. Anybody who's ever been in that kind of a situation, they know what executive executive session entails and how and how, you know, there's things that just happen to have to happen in there. We don't discuss person personnel matters out in yeah. the, the public. And I understand that. But I mean, I know talking to Bruce when I have talked to him, I, I mean, I've seen him at matches and things like that. He's been really good about answering all the questions that I've ever had. Oh, that, what's the lowdown on the leaked document? Wasn't there some sting operation? It sure. It, I don't know. I really don't know. But it, see, it seems to me. What does that, it seem like? It seems Singer to me. It, it seems like it's true or it's real, but I don't know what he meant. What, what's well, the, true? What's real? Well, the, the document exists. I mean, they right. wrote something, but the but in the in the context of it, the whole before Hopkins gets in the tent, it, this was, this was, a lot of this, as I understand it, was with respect to the idea that Hopkins is running for president. Now he says he says that he's running for president, even though he hasn't like gotten his his signatures in, which is really kind of weird because he was running around Area Three getting signatures for his presidency after he was already Area Three director. So I don't, I'm not really sure how he said that that was his area director um, signatures when he was getting them at Area Three for president. That didn't make any sense to me when he said that in the Go Fast That's Don't Suck thing. But that's neither here nor there. But there's, there's a rumor going around that some of that do that document was actually made um, with the idea that it would actually get leaked out just to see who actually was doing the leaking. Do we know who leaked it? It sure it sounds like it, it sounds like it might have been Hopkins. There's you can never really tell. And to try okay, and search does, down who the actual leak the it old, sure does seem the like old it came tickling from one the, specific person. The it's old tickling the wire. Tickling the wire. Tickling and the so wire. The but the whole point of, you know, before Hopkins gets in the tent, I mean, they're like, Well, okay, if he wins presidency, we should have all this stuff figured out before he's actually president so that he is so that whoever becomes a president fundamentally they're start. They're not having all of their stuff changed, you know, halfway through their presidency. Yeah. And when, when it's explained to me like that, I'm like, yeah, I would certainly want to know. That, you know, I mean, everything that I'm supposed to do as president or architect or whatever before I actually agree to take on the, on the assignment. Well, and, and even so if even if it doesn't happen before, who knows what it is, and well, Steve? I mean, it's such a weird. Okay. So, good. That's enough of that. Well, yeah. even even if it yeah. happens before the. Even if it doesn't happen before the next president gets elected, it can be something that happens, you know, in the next three years after that. So, sure. Whatever. Well, it'll ha this this will happen before um, the election. So oh. they want this all done before the election, so that the people who are running for president know what they're running for, which I think is perfectly fair. Well, it's, why? It, it, why do we have to hurry and do this? Exactly. Just because we tossed someone out of office, we don't have to hurry and make a bunch of changes before we get someone elected into the office again. No, but yeah. we have to. But but if we say that there was a problem with Foley, so we had a problem before Foley. Foley came in and said, "Hey, I can fix this because I'm this super professional businessman." They said, "Cool, come in, you fix everything." And the pro the process with that, the problem with that was when he went and essentially ran roughshod over everything in there, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Okay, we made a mistake here." So well, let's they, fix the board this voted with him on all these stupid rule changes. I can't speak to that. I know what the I know what the meeting minutes said, and they all have their excuses. And to be honest with you, some of those are kind of like, like eh, I don't know that I buy them, but they well, did. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Fundamentally, were, they voted the way they, they did. They voted for it. Yeah. The, okay. the one thing is like and not so, not to rush, not to rush into another decision that's not completely thought out. Just yes, because of the, we've, the we've done a lot of rushing before. lately. I mean, a lot of a lot of closed door decisions, a lot of rule changes, a lot of rushing. Let's not continue that pattern. And that's what, but that's what they're doing. Is they're now is they're now taking the time to actually like say, okay, what is it that we want USPSA to be for long term? Let's define that now and then let's run then let's hold our elections. For cycle. the members or are they just gonna do this in closed door executive session and just announce that it's been done? No, I think no. Talking talking to everybody I know, it's all gonna be it's all going to be discussed with the membership. Um well, how much the membership has a you know vote in it. Well they voted for their air director and the air director is going to make the vote. Um, and that's how that form of government works but i do think it makes sense to get to define the role and do it now so that you're not having to come back and do fully 2.0 or go back to straighter with uh, kim who completely cocked everything up i mean uspsa they, they they've said uspsa has grown tremendously in the past couple of years and we've gone from this you know this ragtag little uh, stapled together newsletter 
to an organization that's kind of pretty, should be proud of itself. But along the way, you have a group of people that, I mean, you have to remember the area directors are all part time. So it's, they're not getting paid for any of this. Um, but then you have, you have all these people that they have all their normal jobs and their normal lives. And they're having to like get together in the off hours to, um, deal with all this USPSA stuff. So logically they want to get this thing handled in the most ex expeditious, is that the right word? The, the, the quickest uh, manner yeah. possible to keep everything moving forward. And they know that they have to run a special election. So if they have to run a special election, then they should at least have everything in play so that the people who are running know exactly what they're running for. Because if the president says, well, I'm, a, I'm going to be a president and I'm going to vote or I'm going to make USPSA a still challenge only. And the board is like, oh, that's not exactly what we wanted. Well, you didn't define that. And I think that's the, the goal is at the end of the day, you really do want somebody you want somebody in there that is going to keep the ship of USPSAs sailing. Well, the, the only thing is, like, I would rather hold off an election and figure this out than try to get it done before an election date. I, it, I don't understand. I would rather that they postpone the election to make sure that and get this thing resolved instead of the other way around, which is yep. let's resolve. What this communication the have they sent us the about this? Zero. That's not true. Well, they, they posted board minutes. If you log in, what, what did the board minutes say? Did you read them? Um, I have read them off the top was, of my head. I, there, was I, nothing, I can't really there was nothing in the open part of the email that discussed any of this. Well, there should, um, I tried to log in. There but, should be just a general email that goes out to all the membership that pops up in your inbox so you can pull up and read about it. Not go down and hunting for something that's going to be such a monumental change. Anyways. I I, w I would I would say if you have questions, um, I mean email email get in touch with your your uh, I was gonna say your board of director member your area director, and um, chat with them. Um, maybe maybe you have one that's notoriously awful to communicate, but in my case I've been fortunate because uh, Gary Bruce Gary has been he's been more than forthcoming with everything that he can you know legally speak about. Obviously there's stuff he can't, but nice. he's always been very friendly about explaining his position and i always appreciated that do we have any more gun questions yeah we have gun questions. Uh, we do we have a bunch uh for those that reload their own cartridges any thoughts on full metal jacket versus plated versus heavy plate concave base so like a hollow the the heavy the heavy plate concave base it's the stuff that barry's builds and yeah. they do it my understanding and don't quote me on this because i don't shoot open but my understanding is because of the concave allows you to pack more powder into it, which helps for the open guns. Well, you get a little longer bearing length. The volume is the same. Well, I guess it depends how far you see the bullet. But ultimately, I don't think that matters very much. But you do no. get a longer bearing surface. So you're saying the bullet's actually longer? Yeah, the bullet's taller because the the base is concave. Oh. So you, get, you hollow. Oh, I didn't you know You concave that. the base, and therefore that weight that's in the bullet, it actually goes to bearing surface. Just makes so it a they, little taller. So do they lengthen it on the back end? I mean, the shoulder is still the shoulder, right? Yeah. If you keep the same shoulder geometry and you keep the same COL, the same it cartridge overall length. It just now seats deeper inside the case. Yes, but it doesn't take up any more volume in the case. It just has a longer shoulders down down the bearing edge. Oh, I don't know cool. I was explaining that right. So no, 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 no. I, I get you. That makes sense. So your sense. bullet has the never... same volume no matter how you shape it. Yeah. So your 124 is a longer more like a 147 but still weighs 124. get what i'm yeah. saying so you're, you're yeah you're the heavy plating yeah. isn't the heavy plating mostly for open guns or guns that like to tumble you bullets can, you, you can, might get away you with can push, you can push them a little bit harder and faster um i do yeah. i know that the heavy plating allows that a little better full metal jacket is full metal jacket it, you know uh if you're running open guns uh Gosh, the Delta, the Precision Deltas, things like that, Montana Golds, that seems to be the only way to go. I know a lot of folks who've used coated bullets in open guns, and uh, they work. They do work. Uh, Blue Bullets makes uh, apparently works really well. The downside is that they kind of gum up your comp really, really bad, and you end up like basically soaking it in the dip for you know a week, <laughs> which you know some people get a little bit antsy over. Um, from but, all from the rest of the bullet that didn't make it to the target, you just got to clean that up. Yeah. So yeah, so that's kind of the. It's kind and of your plated. Your plated bullets are going to be what? 
eight cents. They used to be seven cents. Now they're probably eight or nine. Eight or nine. Yeah. And the double, the double thick ones with the different geometry, they'll charge a little bit of a premium for that. And then the FMJs are going to be, you know, ten or fifteen percent more. Ten, eleven, ten, eleven cents, something like that. Historically, like but yeah, who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I honestly, at this point, I will shoot whatever I can get my hands on. And yep. that's that's pretty much my game at this point. So. Yep. Uh, from Doug Dalski, are you guys gonna have guests back on the show again? Either people of interest, like E Men or listeners? Yeah, fine. We'll we'll get it arranged. <laughs> what do you want? Yeah, do. sure. I mean, I I wouldn't do E Men. I mean, first of all, he won't look at the camera, and secondly, he's really quiet and doesn't talk all that much. Yeah. Well, now, if you if you could somehow <laughs> stealth record him when he doesn't know that he's being recorded on a show, that's the Yee Men you oh, want. Oh yeah. Ye- yeah. You get. We you could get... get him to leak a document, read a document that's not supposed to be public. We could record <laughs> that reading. You get a you get a blue it. moon in him. You get a blue moon in him out of TJ Fridays. That's the that's the that's the way to record it. Mm-hmm. Uh, from Sean Sean Edmonds, what's the most prized firearm you own? Like the last one. That would go go if it were for whatever reason you had to sell them all off. Who? I mean, the one I like shooting the most is that stupid Glock 17. I mean, it's not the most expensive one, or arguably the best one, but it's the one that I shoot the most. The 500 Mag would be hard to say goodbye to, but it's so it's so fun to shoot, but it's so impractical that I'd probably have yeah. to let that one go before I let just a nine mil Glock go. Yeah. I, I, I'm probably most sedimentally attached to my, my brig tack just because it's, it's, it's a Beretta. It's my favorite gun. And then two, a, a Brigadier was the first pistol I ever bought. And so it's kind of like everything all in one. So I, I don't know oh, yeah. that. Nice. Robert. I have a, I have a really old 1911. I think it's, I think it was made in 19, 1917 that I got from uh, it's my, one of my coworkers. It was his father's. And um, I'm not really a 1911 guy, but I just like I just like that gun. And just from a pure sentimentality standpoint, I don't think I could ever get rid of that gun. I mean, there's a lot of guns the government doesn't know about that I won't be getting rid of, but this is the <laughs> one this is the one that potentially they'd be looking at. Sure is but a lot I, of aluminum shavings. Uh, yeah, not having nice. a, a lot of guns. Oh, what a beauty. Do this. Hold that up again. He, his father, he went and he changed some parts out on it. And I have been tempted um, for a long time to want to put it back to what would be kind of like stock. But then I'm like, well, I'm never going to sell it. I'm never going to get rid of it. So why would I ever actually change it back? I, well, I mean, the gun only shoots if you exceptionally like to look. well. Only I, if you like the look. That's the only reason you'd put stock parts in. I find because yeah. the, the stock parts for that era were are kind of kind of junky. They're not really great. I yeah. I find the look of 1911s that were somewhere in between when Kimber and uh, Chip McCormick and all those places were making parts. You could just mail order and do it. Like there's something interesting about like those 50s, 60s, and 70s, and like early 80s type 1911s which are kind of custom but are not and then the stuff that we see today so there's like mil spec this kind of like weird area of like a handful of people that kind of wanted to change the gun and then the fully customized guns that all look the same today i like those i like that 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 kind of like i don't know that kind of like 30 year period of like people trying to figure stuff out so they 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 have an interesting look all to their own now those far- that looks those sites look weird to me, Robert. But if they you're do. okay with them, then then you're okay with them. Ring hammer, yeah. no, weird they, sites. No, they, they, are, are, they are they are so goofy looking. I don't know if I don't know how you can see. Yeah, them. yeah, like a Bomar looking. Yeah. yeah, they're not they're not they're nothing. But it's not great, adjusted. But, yeah. No, he no, but he he his dad would shoot bullseye with this thing, and he it was does look like a bullseye sight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he and he was quite good apparently. Um, but, I mean, when when Kirby when Kirby offered it to me. It's kind of one of those things like you're just like, uh, yes, yes, I will take that. And yeah. you, you, you just you take it on principle. Yes. Nice. Today, today on Robert's uh, torture test, I got one of my uh, friends' dad's heritage guns. Now we're going to be doing some drop tests. Here we go, everybody. <laughs> uh, 
No, actually, I I got so um, in the package, I got um, I got this gun, a um, it was a Smith and Wesson uh, 38 357, and then a Smith and Wesson uh, 22, and um, they're like way old. I have no idea how old they are, but they're I mean one of them's I, one of them's not that old. It's only like 1990s. The other one was 1970 something, but I, um, I got all three of those, and it's just like. And I, I've told him so many times. I'm like, look, if you if you ever want to give the ever want these things for your kids or uh, like grandkids or whatever, and he's like, none of them none of them shoot guns. It's not their thing. They don't they don't care about that sort of thing. And it's like you know, if it goes to you, at least I know it's gonna be it's gonna go to somebody that's gonna you know maybe not shoot it tons because of what it is, but they'll at least appreciate care about it, it and, yeah. and appreciate yeah. the value yeah. of what it is. Perfect. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, that yeah. is cool. Uh, from Alex Mansfield, I have an XL750 which is set up for nine millimeter, but I'm looking to get into small loading, small loading for hunting calibers. Uh, for example, three, uh, 357 Magnum, 450 Bushmaster, 308. Should I set up another Dillon tool head or look into a single stage? If so, what press do you recommend? Set up, set like up, a, set up, a, set up another tool head. Um, oh, I wouldn't. It? Well, for I can't remember. I'd get a hunt. I'd get a seventy-five dollar used single stage press, and a set. Of, you're talking about twenty rounds every other year. I mean, who cares? Yeah. Spend yeah, hundred. Just true. buy some used single it, stage press and be done with it. It all. Uh, it all depends case, on the real the estate. Lee, the Lee actually. The Lee's a, the Lee single stage press. It works. I I. To be honest, I still use it to this day for like a huge chunk of it. Whenever I have to like just come up with some brand new load or something like that for obscure stuff, it works. It works exceptionally well. Well, the the one thing about changing out the tool head, it's not like it's that big of a deal. No, it's just that the shell plate and the pins are going to cost you sixty some bucks. Yeah. The tool head's well, going to be seventy five bucks. Oh, oh, you got to get another oh, powder die. No, There's out, another dude, thirty. Uh, bucks. Get the get the Lee Classic turret. It's By the time you've done all stage, that, yeah. you, you I can mean, just have the, another little single stage press and it yeah, just get, get the classic turret. Rounds of shooting, that, hunting ammo. If I had, get the classic turret. That's all you need. It also depends on what you shoot. If I had a lever action 357 Magnum that I wanted to sit there and make ammo for, like 20 is not going to do it. Right. And so it's low volume. It, it's it's so it's it depends on how much you're actually wanting to go out there and shoot because you might start shooting something and then like it, and at least yeah. now you can mass produce it. And the one thing is, but, too, if you, it's like, but then, but if you like it, then you can invest the, the money into getting a proper tool head to mass produce it. Yeah, well, and if you already know your 750, sometimes that's a little easier than setting something True. up. But single stages are pretty yeah. damn easy. It's not bad either way. You'll be okay. It's probably yeah. not a wrong call. Uh, from Dirk Hopkins, what uh, this is to you and Tommy? Uh, what were some of yours and Steve's uh, drawback shooting carry optics? Steve, your drawbacks. I mean, you didn't shoot yeah, this just match, the learning but... curve. Just the learning curve of where the dot is, and find. I just am slower finding the dot than I am finding iron sights. Yeah. No matter what, even after I practice, dry fired it for you know 30 different sessions and shot four matches, I can just draw a Glock 17 and see the sights on the target faster than I can see the dot, even at an open target at seven yards. It's it sounds stupid. It kind of it, it's it, the old it, dog new tricks thing. And yeah. I probably honestly, I know. Mark Walkie would sit me down and he would like he would be like, spend more time with the dot. You don't mm -hmm. know the dot yet. You you're still in the early part of the learning curve. Quit quit whining about it and put the time in so that yep. it, the dot just appears like sights appear. Yeah. So but but so that's my weakness. My weakness is being so used to an iron sight type pace in production that I'm not only learning now um about seeing the dot and just like ripping the trigger and just shooting that thing but there is i could make up for not shooting fast in other positions by executing well and nailing reloads and having good stage plans and now it's just like everyone's got the one magazine change stage plan and they're all freaking going after it and so that change is kind of big it's like okay like, I got to shoot these things as fast as I possibly can, stick the same, basically everyone shooting the same stage plan, and so then it comes down to just ripping the trigger faster. Well, you got to shoot it near open speeds, but you're shooting minor. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. And then you're having an object, which 
you have a, there's a learning curve to making sure you can manage and find it consistently. So yesterday I didn't have any problem finding the dot consistently. I would have stuff like on a plate rack, like I'm shooting a plate rack down, and like the dot would just be kind of like on it or a little too low or something like that, and it's just I'd have like six six shot plate rack. I'd have eight shots, but it's just like I needed six to get my time down to be competitive with everybody else. And so it's just a matter of, of being used to the dot and then ripping the shots off as fast as you possibly can. Well, and my knees be, hurt from all fair, this, the sprinting, all the sheer terror of running as fast as you can everywhere. To be fair, everything that you're doing in carry optics that they want you to, that you're now being required to do in carry optics, you should already be doing in production. But because you have those reloads and um, that that fear factor, you're not yeah, you're not allowing yourself minor, to right? do them. Yeah, they're, they're both, both minor. They're both you minor should, scoring. You should have that. You should have that gun up, shooting in, shooting into yeah. position. I mean, you got you get into position, then you present the gun. You do the IDPA thing. I say that because I do the same exact thing. Yeah. But it's just, I mean, Dave Blanton. I mean, when we shot Area Four together, he he just kept pointing it out. You know, you're you are you are posted up before you your your first shot is fired. Look where Christian Sailor is. He is firing like three or four steps before you even get there. You absolutely should be doing that. Even with an open gun on the target yep. on the target availability, you should be doing that. Even with a, even prod, prod yep. should be doing the same exact things. But you've become so comfortable with getting to a position, posting up, pop 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 pop, and then moving with a reload, pop 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 pop, reload, stand, and that's what you do. The game is changing, and it's requiring that people be people be um, more aggressive yep. and having that gun up and in position. It's it's the craziest thing. But when he pointed it out, I won't go back and I watch all my match videos, and I'm like, son of a gun, yep. he is 100 percent right. And Batista, I mean, he's been telling me that for years, so it's not like this is just something brand new. Everybody's been saying this is what you should be doing. Yeah, it's it's getting used to that level of aggression. Yeah, uh, from Dave Blanton. Hope you're feeling better, Dave. Uh, how much double speak is coming from the serious competitor camp? This is probably related to everything that's going on with like the Z USPSA people and all that other stuff. Um, I remember talking to uh, Area Two once, and they were it was this was um, right around the time of Foley and stuff like that, and they he actually put out a put out a thing says you know send me your opinions tell me what you tell me what you think. Um, um, tell me what, tell me what you think. And he, and he said that like the average person, they're all, they're all writing in, they're all telling him things. The, the high end people, the JJs, the Max Michelles, they don't say squad. They won't say anything because most of them are heavily, um, are heavily like influenced in, um, with their sponsorships and things like that. And they don't want to, they don't want to rock the boat. Yep. Uh, let's see. I have two. There's two more. Two more questions. Um, and I just I just lost it. <laughs> uh, from Rob Chavis. Uh, what's your definition of a serious competitor? Serious competitor. <clears throat> Someone who shoots at least, let's say, one or two major matches a year, and who dry fires. Uh, monthly. Yeah. Pr I don't pr know. Pr I would say practices and yeah, two or three, two or three major matches a year. With, with it's the, pretty low. It's pretty low bar. It's a low bar. But, I mean, yeah. they're but, still serious. I mean, they shoot most of the most of the monthly matches in their area. They travel, and they practice. I'd say that's serious. Yeah, I mean, if you if you literally show don't shoot any club matches, and show up to two or three majors a year, and come in like second or third in your division nationally. Or you know, in the area, like that's that's a pretty serious shooter. So there's plenty of people who you wouldn't consider uh, being serious shooters who shoot 60 club matches and local stuff a year. But as far as being a serious competitor, that's probably it. And you don't have to be good to be serious. You just have to be in the game, work at it. Yep. Shoot some big matches. Yeah, and I, and I, had to, I had to get better. Uh, last question. 
um, from Jeremy Fitzpatrick. What are your thoughts on eliminating bonuses for paid USPSA staff and instead setting compensation based on industry comp comps provided by independent consultants? That could have the potential to, re to remove rule changes made to chase membership growth. Uh, so turning them into a uh, into the uh, sales force there. I don't know. Don't don't ask me about how to pay people. I get paid by the hour. That's all I've ever done. It's just like yeah, you get I'm paid. probably the wrong person to ask too. You get paid. You get paid for doing a job. Go do your job. You don't get don't do your job. You don't get to show up anymore. Like uh, that's that seems like it's pretty self-explanatory. The the idea of having a bonus structure for doing the sales you're supposed to be doing as an incentive, like. I don't know. But... Yeah, I don't know. I um... you're way over at this podcast, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Should 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 USPSA staff get bonuses? Um, bonuses for doing your job? Is that is, is does that happen in the real world? Um, I don't. I mean, like occasionally, we'll get bonuses. You know, like a summer bonus or something like that. Just you know, thanks for all your hard work. But that's more of like a gift than anything. Yeah. But... Well. Um, if there's I don't, a... I don't know that the rules are being changed. Well, no, I guess they are being changed to get the membership growth. Cause that was the whole flashlight nationals. No, yeah. I, I, I would, know. I would say like just here, it's just like the girl scouts, you, you sell enough cookies, you get a, a special treat. But as far as like, we're going to pay you a bonus, um, for basically doing your job, like set, set an astronomical number. If someone hits it, fine. Yeah, they get to be the super grand master. They get a super grand master card and ten thousand dollars. Like we we can set it up that way. Well, I mean, you, that actually is an interesting point because I mean, if you incentivize people to do better, and then they do better, are you upset that they did better? No, it it well, it, it it's... depends if they make a bunch of stupid rule changes. But if they did it with if they did it in the, within the confines of your uh, what do you call it if they did in the confines of what you of the, your the incentive parameters structure that you, yes of your, yeah yeah that then I mean, that, then that could be then, okay that then be bad well you just don't want to incentivize i'm asking here because that's it's such an odd it's a it's an odd question that i'm i'm so far outside yeah, um, i don't know I'm i just, just not smart there i would rather have one big bonus instead of an incentive structure that has some um i would say like low-hanging bonuses for mediocrity so but honestly, for me, it's just show up, do your job the way that you do your job the way that you told me you would do your job when you said that you would do it that way when you got hired. Just do it that way, and then you should be okay. Like the the employee, you promised them that you would be at the beginning. If you do that, it, we shouldn't have any problems, right? Such a, such a novel concept. <laughs> it's like it's like when everyone complains at work is like, remember when the police grabbed you and forced you in here? No. You drove here willingly. Remember when you told him you would do it this for this much and you'd do it a safe job? Yeah? Well, okay. We can do that. Anyways, <laughs> thanks for listening, subscribing, downloading, and doing all that jazz. For uh, Steve Kosky and Robert Wyatt, I'm Tom Nelson. Being you peace, love, and souls, we depart into the open waters of the Sea of Life. A little tugboat we like to call the Paragast. Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> Good night, everybody. It's time for French dip subs. Ooh.